Today we have Mr. Bryce Henderson from No Kill Las Vegas joining us on the podcast. We want to say welcome to Bryce, and uh, I'm excited. Bryce Henderson. I'm uh, my wife and I founded No Kill Las Vegas, and we started getting involved with our shelter about a year ago now. Actually, a little over a year ago. We adopted our dog Arbor from there. You can see her back there on the couch. What she's a uh, she's the famous painting dog. Facebook page Go Vegas Dog, and she's got about three hundred eighty thousand followers right now. Oh so wow! <laughs> we we had uh, adopted her from the Animal Foundation. That's our local shelter here in Las Vegas, the Kill Shelter, and we wanted to you know help them out, of course, and so we helped promote their events. Um, Arbor's on the side of one of their adoption vans. She's wrapped on the side of it. And uh, we thought, you know, we wanted to give back definitely and let people know what great pets rescue animals can be. And Arbor was such a great example. So when we, the more we started working with them, the more we found out that we weren't getting the whole truth. The public wasn't getting the whole truth. And when we went and volunteered there, we would see empty kennels. And we thought, well, that's great. No animals are getting killed today. And we came to find out that wasn't true. They were killing animals, whether they were empty kennels or not, for ridiculous reasons like missing hair, a broken tooth, having allergies. They were finding any reason they could to save money to kill these animals, and uh, it was just more convenient for them. And Nathan Winograd talks about that quite a bit. You know, it's just convenient. It's cheaper. And so they'd rather just kill the animals because it's a lot less work. So when we found all this out, we still wanted to, uh, we investigated and we found out about Nathan Winograd and that there are no-kill shelters all over the country, open admission shelters just like ours is. And we went to the director of the shelter and we told her, hey, we, you know, we've discovered all these great ideas that are working all over the country where they're saving at least 90% of the animals that come in there. And that's basically what qualifies as a no-kill shelter, saving 90% of the animals. And we went with them with our ideas and they weren't interested. Um, they're a very arrogant bunch and they think it's their shelter even though it's 60% tax dollar subsidized. And they don't want people coming in telling them how to run their shelter. They think they know what they're doing. And we soon found out that we weren't the first people that had approached them with these ideas. Other groups and individuals had been approaching them about them before. So that's when my wife and I decided to be vocal, go public, and uh, using Arbor's Facebook page, she has a lot of followers, and when we post something on there, more people read that than read the local paper. Uh -huh. So obviously the Animal Foundation was not happy when we started um, going public about what was really happening at their shelter, but the community really rallied behind us, and they had been wanting for such a long time to have a voice and uh, we were able to do that for them finally because as them individuals they, they felt like they weren't able to ever accomplish anything and the Animal Foundation was too big and would just you know squash their voice but uh, with our um, constant updates on Facebook we started reaching more people who didn't know what was going on at the Animal Foundation and then we had a rally last November where we had 400 people come out in the rain. It doesn't rain in Vegas that often. Uh, when it rains here, people don't know what to do, and they usually just stay inside. But we got them to come out to this rally in front of the shelter, and it was a wonderful experience, um, very emotional for lots of us. And we talked about what was happening at the Animal Foundation, and we all had signs, and we picketed in front of them, and it was covered in all the local media. And um, after that, my wife and I said, you know what, this – this is something we want to continue doing, and so we decided at the end of December to form an actual nonprofit, which is called No Kill Las Vegas or NKLV. You can find us on the web at nklv.org, and um, you can sign up and become a member there. In just three and a half months, we have registered over 1,200 members in uh, NKLV. So people definitely want change. It's not going to be easy here because of the political connections that our shelter has, but um, you know we are not going to stop until we have a new organization running our shelter that 
understands the no-kill model, believes in it, and wants to try to implement it. In just the um, you know the four or five months since we've been involved in this, we have discovered you know a whole new world when it comes to no-kill. I didn't even know it existed um, five months ago. I thought no kill was just a catchy slogan. I didn't know it was a reality and it was working in other communities. And you know, so we're spreading that message all over Vegas. We have a huge rally planned April 27th, and we want everybody to show up for it. This one, I promise, it won't be raining. We're <laughs> going to be doing it in front of the Orleans Casino, and it's April 27th from 10 to 1 o'clock. This is when the Animal Foundation holds their biggest fundraiser and event of the year. It's called Best in Show. Oh, wow. They, they bring dogs out, and they parade them around, and then they auction them off like, like merchandise or like slaves. And uh, we're not in favor of that, of course. And this is just a great, um, a great time to bring everybody together, not to just protest the auction, but just the Animal Foundation in general and their practices. All of their board of directors will be there, their big donors, their sponsors, and people in the community who don't know what's going on at the Animal Foundation. So we want to have more people outside protesting than they actually have inside attending the event. I think we can do that and send a big message to the community that we're not going away. Uh, Animal Foundation, is that the actual name of the shelter, or is it the, Le is it the lead or the Lied shelter? Or how do you pronounce yeah, it? Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of people call it Lied because they do lie a lot. Um, but um, yeah, I picked up on that right? as well. But uh, the shelter, the actual building is called the Lead Shelter. I think it was originally a city or county run or run shelter, and then the Animal Foundation came in ten years ago and took over the county contract, the city of Las Vegas contract, and the city of North Las Vegas contract. So they operate out of the Lead Shelter. But it's pretty much all their people in the buildings and, and running the, the shelter. They do everything except animal control, which is going out and picking up the animals. Now, did I read correctly that that is uh, one of the biggest shelters in the whole country? Yeah, I think as a single um, location, they might take in more. Um, I'm still researching that and, and think it might be debatable, but... That's one of the problems with the shelter. You have a community here of two million people, um, and to only have one location for people to go to is just uh, it's impractical when you're trying to reconnect people with their pets. And and when they took over, they originally just had the city contract, and then a few years later they got the county contract. And a lot of people said, "Hey, this isn't a good idea to have all of the." communities, all the municip municipalities doing their shelter from one single location. Right. Like LA City, of course, takes in a lot more animals than the Animal Foundation does, but they have five or six different shelters. Yeah, we have, around we, have the seven. we have seven, seven. in the city and okay. seven, then seven more in the county. So. Right. And you took in um, maybe like 56,000 LA City. I don't know if you know that. I don't know offhand. I think it might be around there. Um, Animal Foundation took in forty, a little over forty thousand last year. So as a community, they're not taking in more animals than LA or Phoenix. If you're bringing in all those animals to one facility, I mean that's a whole different, you know, ball of wax. I'm curious about those numbers because I spoke to two people here in Vegas in uh, rescue, and they say because my point was, hey. What uh, Nathan writes about in his book is that there are models in place that the no-kill is happening. I mean, um, Tompkins County, New York, has been doing it for seven years. Charlottesville, Virginia, for three years. Reno, Nevada, is reporting you know, 90% no-kill rate. And some of the people that I've been speaking with out here in Rescue are saying that we are just getting more intake than any of those places and like how could we what are, what are the actual stats do we know is there somewhere we can go to see that because there are models in place that are working but what I'm hearing from actual people that are in rescue that we are getting more than those other places what do you have to say to that sure well like I said LA does get in 
more animals. They just have more locations spread out around around the community. Okay. Um, Austin, which is a no-kill community, doesn't take in as many animals as the Animal Foundation, but they also we have 1.6 million people here, um, 2 million if you count the city of Henderson that can adopt these animals. This is a statistic that'll blow your mind. In Reno, a community that's five times smaller than Las Vegas, they adopt out approximately the same amount of animals as the Animal Foundation does. So in the, the community of Reno, let's say they have 400,000 people, they're able to adopt out about 10,000 animals a year. We're here in Las Vegas where we have 2 million people, they're still only adopting out 10,000 animals a year. So the problem is the Animal Foundation isn't marketing their animals. Right. They're, they're charging way too much for them. There's a lot of problems uh, with what they're doing, but um, it's not because there's not enough people here to adopt that many pets. We have 2 million people. If we found you know, 20,000 people out of those 2 million to adopt an animal once a year, you would have a no-kill community. The desire for new pets every year is like, you know, this certain percentage of people and just a fraction of that, philosophically, I guess the way you look at it is just a fraction of that could wipe out Absolutely. most of the killing if people would actually go to the shelters and choose adoption. If just a fraction of those people would choose adoption instead of, you know, getting it from a breeder or getting it from, you know, a pet shop or all these other options that are out there. Right. That's the argument that's made, essentially. What's going on uh, in L.A. City, Josh? I mean, NKLA is, is kind of uh, aligned fully with the city shelters, but it, it, it implies that the city shelters aren't killing, and they, you know, they're, they're acting just as they were acting three, four, five, ten years ago. Um, so it, it just implies that, you know, five years from now, and I think we're already three years into it, so by whatever... 2016, we're supposed to have a quote-unquote no-kill community, which uh, I don't really see that happening. But it does. If you read anything that Nathan Winograd has wrote, and the, the I think there's 12, or 12 or 13 or 14 steps that as a as a shelter manager you should put into place. A lot of these things aren't even being done. And and the main part about no-kill is you got to make a decision right then. That you're going to change philosophy, uh, your philosophy right, right. from day one, and that's what makes the most dramatic change. Because then you implement all these programs and X, Y, and Z, and none of that's being done. They're 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 instead going the route of we got a five year plan, and each year it's just like another year. So I don't I don't know. Uh, the conversation that Bryce and I had before was. And actually, Nathan talks about in his book is shelter directors' refusal to embrace the no-kill paradigm. I mean, so for anybody listening, what's happening is these people are getting money that's supposed to go to a shelter, and you know, the definition of shelter is to you know help and and nurture and save and and not kill. And they're taking this money and they're killing perfectly healthy animals. They're not putting them to sleep, they're not euthanizing them, they're killing perfectly healthy, well-behaved animals. And the only way that this is going to change is to get those people out that don't want to, just like you said earlier, Bryce, that don't want to be told how to run their shelter. Well, you know what? It's not your shelter. All that shit stops at the door. All the friendship and the friendliness that we had stops when you're killing the perfectly healthy animals. That's bullshit and it's unacceptable. You know, Tino, we lost friends when we went public with going no kill, but I tell you what, we made a whole lot more by doing that, by taking that choice. So um, the friends that don't believe in this model, that don't want to be friends with us anymore, they're not the type of people we want to be friends with anyway. As far as the model, let's, let's get into um the model a little bit more in detail and I, I know I reference a couple of the steps that Nathan talks about um, and you know I've read his book I don't want to speak on his behalf of course he's a hell of a lot more eloquent than me but I you know I know most of the steps so let's just touch on what what wasn't going on at you guys' shelter in Vegas which is the lead shelter and I can also chime in with what's not going on at the shelters that I visit. I primarily visit Carson out here from LA County 
And so I can give insight into what they're not doing. Do they have like a high volume, low cost spay and neuter clinic or clinics, more, more than one that are available to the community? And when I say low cost, I mean like actually low cost, like not giving you like a $30 voucher to cover like a $150 surgery. I'm talking like make the surgery like $25, $30, period. That's a low cost surgery. The problem we have with our shelter out here, Josh, is that they they talk a lot, but they don't really do anything. Um, they say we're going to do spay and neuter. They have a mobile adoption. I mean, I'm sorry. They have a mobile spay and neuter van equipped and ready to go out in the community. It sits in the parking lot all the time. They don't use it. Wow. You know, they they claim to involve the community, have volunteers, but they don't. You really use the volunteers for anything. They go walk the dogs a little, and then after a while, um, they find out they're not really helping. They find out what's really going on, and they lose their volunteers. They're not marketing their animals. They market their image, right, Tino? Yeah. They're concerned more about their image than they are marketing their animals. So I think that's true with a lot of shelters. That's definitely true with um, Carson. You know, the minute I walked on their facility to take pictures, they were more concerned with what I was going to say about the dogs that didn't end up making it out. Uh, versus the fact that I was actually there to take pictures of their dogs. And right. were, so. You know what really uh, uh, pisses me off about the, what's going on here with the Animal Foundation is the money that they're getting. I mean, they're getting huge donations. I mean, we know that Elaine Wynn sits on the board, right? Right. And then her, so her husband, Steve Wynn, the guy who owns the strip, basically, I mean, and, here, and don't... Don't get don't misunderstand. I'm not saying go after their money and and shame on them. What I'm saying is they've got money, they've got the backing. We can do this thing right. And so for people listening who may have connections with the winds, I know of one person in particular. Um, let's start uh, giving them the information. Look, this model's working. Do you do you realize? Elaine Wynn, how many animals they're killing? Do you, do you know what's going on over there? Um, there's there's a there's a way to do this. It's not a it's not a it, it's not a theory. It's not a myth. It's not an urban myth. It's happening. We can change this. We can stop the killing, especially when there's empty kennels. You bring up the money, Tino. You know, Winograd talks about how it's actually it can be cheaper to go no kill. You know, and um, a lot of people like to use that myth and say, well, we can't do it because we don't have the money. Um, here in Vegas, though, we actually have the money. They have three and a half million dollars sitting in the bank, which they could use right now to start treating animals, housing animals, whatever they need to do. But they're not. They want to keep their money. That was my point. Continue. Sorry, that's exactly my point. Public relations is a big part of of, of this. You have to kind of uh, be honest with the community. Tell them what your goal is. Set the goal. Have that be your mindset and just be honest and transparent about it and involve the community instead of demonizing the community and blaming the killing on them, which is what the shelter, the, the current shelter is set up to do is basically, whether, whether you agree if overpopulation is a myth or not, and I kind of find that rhetoric to be uh, very divisive amongst people, whether they believe that or not, it kind of puts people on two sides of a fence right. and keeps them from working together. And it's, it's and so... There, there's dynamics about what is no kill and what isn't that's kind of problematic in my opinion, but you know it's it's got to the current shelter system basically says well we have to kill we're do we're doing it because overpopulation is out of control we have all these animals and it's the public's fault they're not taking any accountability to the fact that animals are being brought to the shelter once that once that animal is dropped off at the shelter it becomes the property of the shelter and their job exists to find that animal a new home. That's what their job, that's what they're supposed to be doing, is to, is to rehome that animal. That's their job. Right. And, and instead of taking ownership of that, they tend to just blame the public and be like, well, all, we just have to kill. We don't have any other options without looking into those other options. And I think, you know, um, the Animal Foundation loves to blame the community in the media. I in, think most shelters paperwork. Do. Yeah. And I'm not going to say, obviously, there's things in the community that uh, people can do better, but um, you need your shelter to be the leader, to teach the community, to show the community how to do it. And then what we've seen in other communities is the shelter director alone can make the change. 
you, you don't have to find a whole new community to have a no-kill shelter. You need a shelter director who's a leader who knows how to implement the policy. You don't need the new community. You need the new director that brings that brings the mindset that, that is going to be different. That's where it starts. Without that, you got nothing. One of the problems with the Animal Foundation, what are they not doing? Number one thing is they won't commit to it. They say no-kill is not possible. So basically they're saying we're not going to try. So, and that's one of the main tenets is you need a director who says, hey, we are going to make a commitment to this and we are going to do it. Here's our plan and I need your help. That, that's kind of what I was kind of referring to with, uh, and I'll use the overpopulation thing again. That, that seems to be the phrase that kind of either, that kind of cuts people out of the equation. They hear, they may not know who Nathan Winograd is, but yet they'll hear that he said that. And as soon as they hear that he said that, they kind of, they kind of go, they move, they move on. They don't look further into what he's talking about. They hear, he says overpopulation is a myth. What a, what a kook. He must not know anything about what he's talking about, and they won't even look into why he's saying that. So it's like that rhetoric kind of divides the entire community because a lot of people don't believe that it's a myth, and, and then they just kind of, uh, you know, wipe their hands of the whole process. The, the, the no-kill topic can be so divisive when in, in reality we should be looking at the, fifth, the, the 15 or so steps that are there and start implementing them into every shelter. And even if, and even if a kill shelter doesn't achieve that, you know, quote-unquote 90% kill rate out the gate or whatever, which kind of defines you as a true no-kill in Winograd's definition, if, if they implement, let's say, eight of the 15 steps and their adoption numbers go up 10%, like, that's still a good thing. They shouldn't wipe their hands of the entire process, like you're saying, because they just believe it not to be possible. It says here in um, Nathan's book that uh, Reno's success occurred immediately after the hiring of a new shelter director committed to no-kill, passionate about saving lives. Her appointment followed the 20-plus year reign of a darling of HSUS member of their National Sheltering Committee. Committee. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about these people that are dug in like ticks. Whether whether it's uh, um, you know what, what's the word I'm looking for nepotism or whether they just they're there they're dug in and and I understand you know I, I can't imagine what it must be to, like to be over at that at that animal uh, shelter. Uh, every day with all the intakes. I know they're getting so many animals surrendered every day and I guess it can just be overwhelming but, but the thing is is what you're doing isn't working. It, 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 the killing of animals is not something that you should get numb to. But they are numb to it and they can't you know we can't change our director. She's it, that's, that's asking a lot. That's why you need a new director. You can't ask our director to say come out in the public and say, you know what, everything I've been doing since I've been here is wrong, and I just have had my eyes open. She'll never do that. She's going to continue the mantra of it's the community's fault, and we are trying to, to deal with the community's problem. She's but never going to change, so we need a new director, and the only way we're going to get that is to get rid of the Animal Foundation altogether. We know, we know who you're talking about, but wouldn't that be nice if people could just own up you know, and just say, hey, you know what, I messed up, I was wrong, please forgive me, but this is what I'm going to do. I mean, it's so sad because, God, if we could just be, if everybody can just be that noble and that and that responsible and just say, look, you know what, I messed up, this is what needs to happen, but you know what, I mean, this person we're talking about, if you see this, we're, yeah, you know we're talking about you. You got to change you gotta, or you got to get out. They have to be willing to try. Um, and there's plenty of things that are being suggested that they should be open to trying. There's no reason why they shouldn't genuinely try. And when I say try, I don't mean whitewash it. I don't mean say you're going to do something and then just, just do the same thing. I mean genuinely try. And that's what, that's, that's what we're talking about, about the mindset of the director, because a lot of these directors, Tino, you're right, and, and Bryce, you're right. It's an entrenched system. They... they in order to genuinely try, they have to first admit that what they were doing prior probably wasn't working that well. And, um, you know, a lot of these people are desensitized, and a lot of it has to do with ego, because you're, ba you're basically admitting 
that what we were doing wasn't really working and all these animals were being killed when they could have potentially you know been saved or a lot of them could have been saved and we made the choice to kill instead and that is a big step that to actually admit that and when we're talking about an entrenched system you're really not gonna get that type of honesty from no. someone currently running a shelter that's doing that I want to introduce you guys <laughs> buddy um, Buddy came from Lead Animal Foundation. He's got a little pink nose. And actually, um, his story is up on our website. I actually documented the whole thing because when Peace, Love, and Pipples first started, what I was doing was, we spoke about it before on our uh, other podcast, that um, I, I'd been kicking around the idea of getting involved in rescue in, in some capacity. And I just was like, I don't have the time, I work another job, I, I don't have the facility, what can I do? And then I saw a video called um, Just One Dog mm -hmm. uh, about Stanley and an organization called Camp Cocker and I said, you know what, I can do that. They saved a dog, Stanley, excuse me, on uh, Christmas Eve and I said, you know what, I can do that. So in 2010 I started Peace, Love and Pit Bulls and what I did was on New Year's I went and got a dog, her name was Bailey, my first rescue. She lived with us, I trained her found her home. She's still living in that home. So I did that about once a month until I found Buddy. And Buddy's story is up there as well. You should check it out. He was his pit bull in the Lead Foundation, Animal Foundation. And well, he wouldn't even come out. He wouldn't even come out. And I go, who's back there? Because I saw that it said pit bull. And they got him out. And I, actually, I went into the cage and got him out. And I put a leash on him. He was petrified. His tail was tucked deep under his legs. And I said, I got to take this dog because, first of all, he's dark, and uh, the darker dogs have have more problems getting um, rescued, and uh, he's a pit bull. So I said, I got to take this dog. The other ones, you know, how do you pick? That's the, the, that's the dilemma. Well, I knew this guy didn't have a chance, so I took him. He was my last one that I took because <laughs> I don't have room to do any more. So he's a foster fail. I ended up keeping him. Um, and the, the, the reason for this rant and in introducing Buddy is um, go to the shelter. The, what I found with the last two dogs I rescued, and I have a little yapper that I found on the side of the road, these dogs, they know that they're getting a second chance, and this dog will not leave my side. Everybody else is kind of spoiled. They've been with me since they were puppies. So I'll go, I'll go upstairs, I'm sleeping, and I come down to get something to drink in the middle of the night, and he is always there. He's always wondering where I'm at. He's loyal beyond loyal, and he's from the lead animal shelter here in Vegas that kills 15 to 20 of these type of dogs every day. 15 to 20 pit bulls is the last number I heard of how many they're killing every day in the pound. So people... Stop with the backyard breeding. Stop with the I want to get papers and I want to breed my dog so my family can, my kids can see the miracle of birth. Cut all that bullshit out. Go to the the, the pound and get yourself a buddy because this guy, and this is buddy, this guy is the best. It's nice that we have three guys here talking about this because so often uh, when I go to events, it's the women who show up to support the animals. And there's nothing wrong with that, but us guys need to get involved too. It's very rewarding, it's very cool, and you'll meet more women than you ever would on Match.com. So if you're interested in doing something good for your community, get involved in rescue. I want to encourage more guys to do that. And, you know, touching on that, adding to that, I just started my six-week uh, boot camp. I, I do a free, if, if anybody rescues in Vegas, if anybody rescues a pit bull type dog in Vegas, my class, if you can't afford it on Sunday, is free. But I also do uh, a, a six-week boot camp I call for people. It's more intense, more advanced training. And I do five spots, and it's usually all women. And like one guy last was the last time, and now it's one guy and all women. Um, and it goes with training too. Hey, guys. You know, don't be ashamed to ask for directions. You know, as guys, you know, we're sitting in the car with a girl and we're running around in circles instead of just stopping and asking someone for directions. It's the same thing here. Get over your ego. If you have a dog that's pulling on a leash, that's that's uh, standing off with other dogs and, and going and growling at other dogs, don't be afraid to come out and get some 
uh, some training. It, it seems to me the thing that you just said about women is the same thing for training. It's mostly women that I get out of these classes. As far as the training and what I see at training classes, I can't really comment on. But yeah, as far as as far as uh, uh, who is kind of on the ground level at the shelter in the shelter system and trying to work to make change, I would say it's probably you know definitely primarily. Um, women um, and you know you can just look into your we all have Facebook pages you the insights that they give you you can kinda click into the insights and see who has liked your page and you know how many are men and how many are women I would say just on off my page alone and I think I have like you know 12,000 likes or whatever I'd say that probably 80 percent are women right so so not only are the people that are on the ground, mostly women in rescue, but um, people that are networking online and kind of helping you from kind of that second tier position are also mostly women. So, hey Bryce, um, any word on that uh, uh, the Nathan Winograd movie coming to Vegas? Have you guys narrowed that down? Or? Yes, it looks like for everyone here in Vegas who wants to come out and actually see Nathan Winograd, he's going to give a presentation and show the movie Redemption. It's going to be August 15th, and uh, I'm going to sign the paperwork for the theater on Wednesday, and after that's all taken care of, I'll announce it. I don't want to say anything, and then for some reason it falls through. Right, right. But, uh, but we've got the date nailed down, August 15th. And the seating will be limited. We're going to sell them online initially first, and they might all go before uh, we even get close to opening night. So if anyone wants to go, uh, follow our Facebook page. I didn't give that out earlier. It's Go Vegas Dog. That's Arbor's Facebook page. And that's where we'll be making announcements about uh, when those tickets are on sale. So you said limited seat. Do we know how many seats this is going to be? 399. Part of this is is creating you know comprehensive and consistent offsite adoption events for these animals that happen like multiple times a week. I know the shelters that I go to, especially LA County, they don't do any offsite adoption events. Uh, I mean, they may do like one a month if we're like extremely lucky. Um, I don't know how how is it at the lead shelter? I mean, what are they doing right now, and what can they what can they be doing? It's very limited out here as well. They'll go to a, a fundraiser or something once in a while. They'll bring animals out, but they used to go out to the pet co's and pet smarts, like we see so many of our rescue groups doing. Seven eight years ago, they would do that, but they stopped doing it, and I don't know why. They don't do it very often. And uh, they don't bring them to events where they really get a lot of traffic. Um, it's more special occasion type of events. And I think they would uh, have a lot more success if they were out every weekend in front of two or three pet co's and pet smarts. My girlfriend became a volunteer at Carson. And they fired her basically because she's my girlfriend. And she kind of actually does good work. She takes out the pit bulls. She does all this stuff that most of their volunteers aren't even doing. But it's like... The shelters that I've been to, especially Carson, they claim we're, we're short staff. We don't have enough staff. We don't have enough volunteers to do all these things. But they only want volunteers that are going to carry their water. Like if you, if you get a volunteer in there that wants to do something different, they're immediately put on the outside. Right. They're either, they're either not able to become a volunteer or they fly under the radar, become a volunteer, and then they get suspended and or fired. With county... They, they only do one class, one training class per year for volunteers. So they just did one in January, and there was like hundreds of people that have applied and were just waiting for the class. Like I applied nine months ago, and, and it took them nine months to get back to me and say the training class is here. And then once they realized that it was me who applied, they said I couldn't come to the class. So it's like... You can't sit here and say we don't have manpower, we don't have any volunteers, we don't have staff, while you're at the same time turning away staff and, and volunteers in droves that aren't willing to do the same old, same old. We have uh, you know, the same problem out here. They have frequent orientations, the Animal Foundation, uh, so that's fortunate, but um, I think they drop the ball after that. They don't follow up with the volunteers. They don't give the volunteers a lot to do. 
and um, they're kind of wasted. You know, up in Reno, they have a lot more volunteers at their shelter, and they actually involve people uh, as opposed to the Animal Foundation. And not only will they not listen to volunteers' ideas, they don't even listen to their own employees' ideas. We have a lot of former employees of the Animal Foundation who have spoken to us and said, I went to them with a great idea to help them with behavioral problems, to help them with the feeding schedule, whatever it might be, and they're not interested. So this vet tech school is on the campus, and I believe uh, that they pay rental space to use the property. And uh, they train people how to be vet techs, and they do all their labs over at the Animal Foundation. Uh, she told one horrifying story. Um, they work on live animals and uh, that are up for adoption. You know, they'll they'll do um, practice vaccines. Um, the way she said it worked is their instructor would pick up over to the youth tech and say, hey, we need 10 animals today. We're doing such and such procedure. And they would bring over some fresh kills. This one day they brought over the animals and they come in body bags. And they, go, they open up the body bag. It's a cat. And they go to start to doing the incision on the cat. And the cat starts meowing and wakes up. Oh, jeez. And, uh, yeah, so this cat was had gone through the euthanasia, was not killed. And, of course, they sent it back to the euthanasia room where they did kill it, and then they brought it back. So, um, you know, that's the type of things that are going on over there, and it's very hard to get this type of information. But... Um, People that go through their system who don't become desensitized, um, it horrifies them, and, um, and many of them contact us and tell us what's going on. Bryce, what about this heart sticking? Is that still happening? And explain what that is. From what we've heard, the Animal Foundation does use the heart stick. Um, I mean, it's, and there's many states where this is illegal. Nevada is not one of them. We were told that they do not use this method. The director told us to our face when we asked her. She said, no, we don't use hard stick. And we've had multiple people now tell us that they do use the hard stick. And uh, the Humane Society does not recommend it because it is very difficult to do, and it can cause a lot of pain to the animal. It's very difficult to hit the moving heart. And if you miss, you hit a lung, and the animal suffocates. What, it's cost effective or it's, it's faster? What's the reason for heart sticking? Some people think it's easier um, because you don't have to um, give them a sedative through an injection. Exactly. If the animal yeah. is difficult to handle, it's difficult sometimes to give them a sedative to knock them out. So that's why some places use a heart stick. As far as what I've heard with a lot of shelters in California, I've you know, I've heard people who were former volunteers, former staff, talk about how many of these shelters out here don't even use the sedative because it's cost effective to, to not use it. Um, so, so a lot of the animals that are, are euthanized, because there's a process to it. There's like a, you know, they give them a sedative first, then, then the actual solution. They cut the sedative out and go right to the solution sometimes to save money. So the dog's awake when it, when it stops breathing or it hearts, its heart stops. Right. It's faster and cheaper. Oh, Jesus. It's hard to get people to, to talk about that because most, even if there's good people on the inside who know that that's going on, the minute they speak out about it, they're going to be reprimanded. Demonized. Um, they're, they're going to either lose their position as a volunteer or if it's a rescuer, for example, that maybe was in a room one day and saw it happen or heard through the grapevine. If they started talking about it, the shelter will take the rescue's full rights. There's a lot of ways to retaliate against these people, which keeps them silent, and that's the problem. Um, because I guarantee there's a lot of people out there that know this type of stuff is going on. They want to talk about it. They they even know who to go to to talk about it anonymously or whatever, but they just don't have the courage to do it because they fear that retaliation. Did you make the conscious decision to quit as a volunteer before you did this, or did you kind of start speaking out as a volunteer and they kind of forced you out, or how, how did that process play out? 
Yeah, when we went public on our Facebook page, they told us that we could no longer volunteer there. They terminated us as volunteers. We'd still volunteer there today if we could. Yes. No, we have the email from them where they told us we could no longer volunteer. So that wasn't by our choice. Uh, it's just another example like you and your girlfriend. Um, they don't want people around who aren't going to toe the, the company line. And, uh, you know, if you object to what they're doing, they don't want you there. The mentality of the director is what needs to be there, but the director's not the one that's going to be doing the work. The work's going to be done by the volunteers. So it's like if you don't have good volunteers, nobody's going to be there to do the work. It's like these programs are only going to be possible if you have a great volunteer staff and most shelters would have that if they ran in a certain way where there wasn't retaliation to work to, to worry about. If there was kind of a level of transparency as opposed to a level of fear, creating a culture that kind of, you know, kicks certain people out and everybody that remains has to work under this guise of, oh, I can't talk about this, I can't talk about that because something's going to happen to me. If all that didn't exist, you'd have this abundance of great volunteers who would be able to implement these programs. So it goes hand in hand. Bryce, do we have a um, uh, somebody on deck, someone who that might want to come in and step in after, you know, we clean house? Is there somebody that's qualified, that, that, that a director that may want to come in with this kind of philosophy? I mean, am I thinking too far ahead? I don't think you're thinking too far ahead at all, but uh, no, we don't have anyone in mind at this point, but you bring up a good point because the Animal Foundation's contract runs up in June 2015. So uh, worst case scenario, that's our target date to get a new organization running the shelter, and we're going to continue to put pressure on our elected officials and raise awareness in the community so that when that contract comes up, that they don't even consider the Animal Foundation, that that's the last organization they would want to renew the contract with. And then when they open up bidding, it's the opportunity then for other organizations to come in. At Leeds, do you guys have any uh, preventable program basically put in place now to when owner surrenders come in, they're given options, they're you know told to a certain extent what could potentially happen, they're asked questions. What do you need? Do you need, you know, is it a medical issue? Is it a landlord issue? Is it, you know, a low income issue? Does anything like that exist? That's the last thing they do. They they actually encourage people to bring their animals down if you know if they don't want them anymore. And we have nonprofits who have already approached the Animal Foundation and said, Hey, we will do this at no charge for you. We will help reduce your intake. And we will help supplement people who are having uh, financial issues, that reasons that they can't keep their animal, and they're not arrested. So yeah, there's no there's no excuse for that. That just shows that like, you know, this is a they're protecting like an entrenched system of doing right. it in a way. There's literally no excuse for turning away help like that. None. And the reason they don't want to do it is because they don't want people getting involved in their business. If you're there every day right. seeing what happens. They don't want you to know what's really going on. Let's put out a, a, a an invitation. Anybody from the Animal Foundation want to, you know, retort, you know, come on and say, no, this is not what's happening. You know, hey, there's an open invitation. We'll have Bryce on again, and let's talk about it, you know. If we're wrong with what we're saying about what's happening here in Vegas, and it's not just here. It's like uh, Josh is saying. It's happening out there, too. It's happening everywhere with these with the, with these uh, directors that don't want to change. Uh, if there's something you want to say, we can have a conversation. We're not going to ambush you. We're not going to work in sound bites, which is the whole reason Josh and I started this podcast, was because we're going to give everybody a chance to talk and to state their case. But for me, I don't see anybody wanting to do that. I, if, if they, I don't see that going to – don't hold your breath, people, because I don't think that's going to happen. Well, there's quite literally zero reason why they would not embrace that program we were just talking about. Those resources that we were just talking about, those people that we were just talking about, that are, that are making themselves available to give, to give owner surrenders the option, there's literally no reason 
why a shelter would turn that away other than the fact that they're control freaks who it would be bringing in a faction of people that would have a certain amount of access that they would not be able to control. They can't control what they're saying. They can't control what they're, they're choosing to do. Um, they're not shelter employees, for example. Um, so they turn them away because of that, because, the, because of that element. Um, what, what are they going to see that you're so afraid of? And if that's the case, that they're going to see so many horrifying things, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> you're doing something wrong. And, and that's know, the problem. Stop defending these people. We get it. Nobody wants to kill animals. We'd hope. Before we wrap up, I want to share something that kind of sums up what we've been talking about. This sign we have on our wall here. This was one of our banners that we had at uh, our last rally. Kill bad policies, not animals. And, uh, you know, it's, it's basically saying that we can change this system just by changing how you run your shelter. You don't have to get a new community. You just need to implement the no-kill model and you will start saving animals. I like that. I like that banner. I was curious, you know, the majority of the time we were on here, I could never see what the <laughs> policy I couldn't see the word policy, so I was curious what that was. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you, Bryce, and thanks, Josh, again for another And, and please, everybody, come to our rally on the 27th. Yes. Oh, and by the way, uh, uh, anybody in Vegas, I'm, the Peace, Love, and Pitbulls Kissing Booth is going to be at Wolfstock April 6th, which is, which is a Sunday. Uh, you can see that on our Facebook as well uh, if you're interested in coming out and getting a tongue bath to the sixth power. Um, I look forward to seeing you guys out there. And we'll also be at Petapalooza next Saturday as well with the booth and uh, passing out flyers for the rally and uh, having people sign a petition. We have over a thousand signatures on our petition uh, asking for a no-kill Las Vegas.